It's in here somewhere. Um, my name is Bill Burks, and I'm, a, a, I'm an old person. <laughs> and there's, there's things that happen to us old people. Uh, you know, I used to be able to see anything and everything, and, and uh, now I have to wear these glasses and I can't, can't see, read, or anything else. And especially when they're all fogged up from, 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 from this mask. So I'm going to pull it off. Uh, and I used to be able to hear better than anybody in the world. And now I can't hear a thing. So if you want to communicate with me, you have to poke me first and then holler in my ear because I just, I just can't hear. But that's, uh, that's a reality that happens to human beings. And I guess God set it up that way. But of course, I'm 81, so I'm older than some of the people that God chose to reward before that. And I guess I'm this old because I haven't been good enough to receive the reward yet. <laughs> Except Janice is still with me, so that's, you know, that's what can I say. And uh, we've been buried 50 years and a half. She was my child bride. <laughs> so, so there. Um, about Grace Church. First time I was ever in Paris, I was in college at Austin P. And we marched a, a parade. Was it the Banana Festival? Is that what they have here? Fish fry. Fish fry, okay. Uh, and we marched through town, and I was like 19 years old. So that was 60 years ago, 61 years ago. And, you know, I didn't pay much attention to, to Paris then, but I've been back and uh, a few times. And I recognize some of the faces here. And the last time I was here, Elaine was the organist. And uh, yeah, we've kind of become good friends, but I haven't seen her since she moved away. Glad she's back to see where she started. That she was confirmed here. Yeah, okay. I didn't grow up in the Episcopal Church either. And what am I going to say? How I was attracted not to the church. The thing that attracted me to the Episcopal Church really was a human being was a person, just a person, and I liked him. We shared some things together, uh, and for him, I asked a lot of questions. I'm not gonna tell you some of the other things that happened between us <laughs> first, but I had asked some questions about the church, and uh, after I asked the question, we talked for a while, and I realized I, had, I didn't have an answer, I had two questions. And that happened again. And the more questions I asked about the church, not necessarily the Episcopal church, but uh, I grew up in a fundamental church. So that's why you know, I was needed to ask questions about it. And I ended up more questions. So finally I decided I had to get confirmed. And uh, so I did. And then I went to seminary because all I got was more questions. And three years of seminary, and what I ended up with was a whole lot more questions <laughs> and no answers. And it's almost as if the church, and I thank God, trusted me to make my own decisions, to use my eyes and my ears to look and to feel and be responsible. And in a way to realize that I was created in the image of God, the image of God, that God the creator uh, set all these things in motion and he's not through. You know, it changes every day, new things every day. Like 
glasses, like hearing aids, which don't work very well, but they're better than what they used to be. Like these machines, which are better than they used to be. So, what does all that mean for us? I think maybe it means something like the metaphors that have been used in recorded history of the church. In the Old Testament, the record that's put down is that God was mad. Of course, I don't think God was mad. God created all of this. And I think the reports that come through, you know, it's like listening to the uh, news media. You listen to one news media, you get one report, listen to another for the same thing, and it's completely different. And I think maybe some of the stories in the Bible are reported that way. They have an agenda. And the agenda still carries the truth. And the truth is, God changed his mind. Well, God didn't change his mind. I don't think. Maybe he did. But the reality of what God had created was recognized that all are invited. Of course, the Hebrew people didn't know that. They thought they were the only ones. It's kind of like the fundamental church I grew up in. They thought they were the only ones. Uh, and I just realized I didn't belong. But God did, if God did not change his mind, which I don't think he did, he just brought into the reality that he wasn't through inviting everybody. And here comes Jesus, and he's talking to his apostles, and he's talking to the people who followed him. And when he started, he had a, a, an awful lot of people following him. They followed him everywhere. And as I look around in the, in the world that we live in today, you know, my question is, how many of you people will ever go to hear, how many have you, how many have ever gone to hear a, uh, a tent revival? Have you ever been in a tent revival? I, been, I went one time. It was kind of strange. Uh, a lot of things happened. Uh, People, do, you know, very few people go now if, if when you take the whole thing into consideration. But we do go to see those people. How many go to see, go to a uh, political rally? You know, I've never been to a political rally, so I don't know how many go. The media says a lot, a lot of people do. But I've gone to football games. You know, so that's kind of like going to see a big crowd. <laughs> you know, so all of us are, in, are, are familiar with going to see a crowd. But it occurred to me that you have to have some security, financial security in our day and age to go to these places. If you're going to a football game, you've got to buy a ticket. Gas to get there. You've got to have money to do this with. But if you're really poor, you can't. And I suspect that the people who followed Jesus around way back then, 2,000 years ago, were not the poor people, although teach, preachers tend to say they were. But this is just one of the questions I still have that I got out of seminary was, who are these people who are following him? They can't be poor. They got clothes, they got food, they got time to travel. They don't have to be working all the time. It's just, you know, just one of my things about thinking. And I look at Episcopalians, and very few of us are poor compared to the people who are homeless. But compared to the people to the one percent or whatever you know we really are dirt to them so what does all of this mean so i believe that we are invited to go on the journey the same kind of journey that the israelites were invited to go on 
And when they got part of the way, they got all upset about something in their, in their lives. They got hungry and they got tired and they wanted a symbol that they could hang on to. They wanted a symbol. And they, so they made one out of the gold and silver that they didn't need because what they needed in the desert was, was goats and food. They didn't have any Walmart, so you couldn't use gold to buy food with. Anyway, they took this and they made a symbol out of it. And so the story goes, they started worshiping the symbol instead of the God who was with them always in leading them out, instead of what the symbol stood for, that they could touch the symbol and say, oh, this is the God. We tend to have that same kind of problems. I do, I know. You know, this, to me, is a symbol, and I could worship the prayer book, or I could worship this beautiful stained glass, but it's only a symbol. It's not God, and that's not, that's not the God that, that leads me, that brings me out, that loves me. And I don't understand how and why the God of creation could love me because I certainly am not perfect. I certainly make a lot of mistakes. And I certainly worship uh, <laughs> vain symbols. You know, I, I worship money. I've got to have that. So, you know, I look at my checkbook every once in a while. I look at the bank account to see if I'm going to survive. So there's... There's some worship in that. But the God who sustains me, who's made the promise, it's someone I can't touch, someone I can't see. And it's someone that invites me to the wedding feast. And as I look around our nation, I see so many people who have been invited to the wedding feast of God. And most of them are worshiping symbols, a symbol of something, a symbol of power, a symbol of money, a symbol of control, a symbol, that, a symbol of some kind. And they'll stand up for that symbol rather than what it stands for. The American flag is a good one. I served, I'm a retired military, and you know, to me, the flag stands for freedom. Freedom to protest, freedom to love, freedom to worship, freedom to think. And for some people, the flag stands for only one thing, and they decide what that is. But I don't have any answers to that. And I can't answer for them because I have a problem with them. And you know, I tend to, uh, I tend to think that they're wrong. Mm -hmm. But when I do that, I'm not following the precepts of God. I'm not wearing my wedding robe. What's in your wedding robe? You've got one on, you're here. Do you know what your wedding robe is? Here's some things. Paul knew what it was. And he said this. Your wedding robe is whatever is honorable. It's in the blessing today. He says, think about what is just. You think about what is just. That's a part of your wedding robe. You think about what is pure. That's a part of your wedding robe. You think about what is pleasing. That's a part of your wedding robe. You think about what is commendable. That's a part of your wedding robe. You think about excellence. What has excellence in it. That's a part of your wedding robe. And you think about what's worthy of praise. That's part of your wedding <coughs> robe. And then you think about these things. 
as we look around, as you look around your lives and the people you live with, the people you talk to, are they people who are honorable? Are they do you, people who are just? They, no, no, no. You, know, you may not judge them whether they're honorable, pure, or pleasing, or commendable, or anything like that. It's up to you to look at yourself. Are you honorable to them? Are you wearing your red robe? Some of us, some of us, some people, and, and even I at times, get so bent out of joint that I look to see where the hate is. And I'll point at somebody and say, no, I, can't, I can't put up with all that hate. Instead of trying to myself be pleasing, trying to be myself and be just, trying to understand that these people who have been invited to the wedding feast, their robe may not be like mine. But in the end, for Grace Church, and for you, for all these people here, you have been invited to the wedding. And not only that, you are servants. You wouldn't be here if you weren't servants. And you are being sent out to invite people to the wedding feast. And whether they're good or bad, it doesn't matter, according to the story. You see, way back when, when Jesus told this story, he wasn't inviting people to the Episcopal Church. He didn't invite people to the Christian Church. He said, come follow me. There was no church back then. There were some followers, kind of. By the time of Paul and Simon, they were, you know, they began to be called Christians. But when Jesus was around, there weren't any. Jesus was a Jew. And he just said, come and follow me. But by the time it was over, he only had 12 apostles, 11 apostles left. And they all left him. So if that's us, you know, we can't invite people to the church. We can't say, follow me to the church. But we can do what Jesus did. He wore his wedding garment at all times. He acted honorably. He acted just. He acted pure. He acted pleasing. He acted commendable excellence. And, and as far as I can read after 50 years of this, the only times that he was ever, ever, uh, that he ever lost it, that he ever condemned people, and, I, and I'm not sure it was a condemnation, that he ever put his finger out and straight people out, were people who were religious people who worked for the church, you know, the, the tax changers, the collectors, and, and uh, the people, uh, the bankers in, in the synagogue. You know, these were religious people, people who claimed to be religious, and his own apostles that he would say, don't do it that way. And I have all of these questions, and I still have them, and I hope you have all of these questions too. And as you can tell, I didn't find my sermon, so I'll make it this simple. <laughs> but it's a part of what I believe. It's a part of what God is all about. It's a part of what Christ is all about. And I'm certain that you and I have been invited to this wedding feast. And we're here to be a part of that. Thanks be to God.